Hello and welcome to Classic Gun Reviews. I'm your host Edgar and today we're going to talk about the Beretta 96 Centurion. Uh, but of course this review would uh, pertain to the 92 Centurion as well, the 9mm version, because they're identical except for the caliber. Um, I sold uh, a Centurion just like this a few years ago and I regretted selling it. So I was looking for another one and a lot of them are double action only and this one's double single. So I got really lucky and I found this one in a local uh, gun shop here in Maine. And it turns out that it's only about 100 units off on the serial numbers. Uh, it's 4, 49,000 and something, but it was only 100 units off than the other one I used to have. So it was probably made around probably the same day. Uh, but I really like this uh, pistol. I like the shorter Berettas as well. Uh, the full size are, are really nice to shoot and so forth, but to carry and for getting back on target quicker, the shorter barrels work for me. And that's why I like the Commander and the 1911s and other uh, shorter barrel pistols I, I, I control a little better uh, so I really like this but they're harder to find uh, these uh, Centurions were made from around 92 1992 to around 2004 or so so they're no longer made and they're harder to find I rarely see them in 9 9 is even more difficult to find uh, but you can get these for a good price a lot of them are um, ex uh, police issue so a lot of them have a lot of wear, but maybe not a lot of shooting on them. And just they're, they're a great uh, great bargain. These are a little more expensive here because this one has uh, less wear than those normal police issue ones. And this is also in the traditional double action, single action. Um, I usually put one of my EDC uh, items on my gun reviews, so I thought I would show my newly acquired about a month ago. I've been carrying this every day. This is a Benchmade 560, really nice. Uh, made knife. Beautiful cutting tool. Has a G10 blackened blade, G10 grips that's uh, contoured with two different colors. And look at that, isn't that gorgeous? A really nice uh, red G10 liner, a skeletonized stainless steel liner inside, and really nice anodized red standoffs. I'll be doing a review of this knife soon on this channel, so look forward to that. It's a really nice knife. Highly recommend it uh, as an EDC or any knife. Uh, all right, so let's get back to the Breda Centurion. Really nice. Um, so this one was made in the mid 90s and uh, I mean the 97 or so. And Breda has been really good. There's a place on their website that you could put the serial number in and they'll tell you exactly uh, what year it was uh, made. And it was also during the ban years, the Clinton uh, magazine and assault rifle ban, which included the high cap magazines, none could be manufactured or sold that were 10 rounds or more. And the high cap for this gun is 11 rounds. So 11 plus one. The new Mechar mags, which also makes the mags for Beretta and SIG and other manufacturers is OEM. They have a 12 round mag that's actually reliable. So this gun could, could, be, could use those uh, mags that came out with the uh, 96A1 uh, standard 12 round mag. So 12 round mags are, are fine in this gun. So you got 12 plus one. So it's not too shabby for a 40. So what they did was these magazines uh, were written on them. Let's see if we could read it here for you. Restricted law enforcement government only. But if you got a hold of one of these back then, it was, it was still legal. There it is, 11 rounds. Uh, so the, the banned magazines were 10, not too far off this. Uh, but we can you do, you know, every round counts, I think. So especially when it's not a nine and you have restricted amount of uh, rounds that'll fit in the magazine already. I like these 11 round mags. So uh, this came with one and I found this one on Gun Broker and I was able to get another one. So yeah, really strong, uh, easy to find magazines. These aren't too hard to find or the 10s and they make the 12s now. So no issue with the magazines uh, whatsoever. We're gonna show clear before you handle it. I always clear them before, but just so you can see, there you go. Um, really comfortable grip. If you've held a Beretta before, I find that they're very, um, very, very comfortable. The, the grips are rather slim, so it doesn't add too much to the thickness. But if you have, um, relatively small hands, it will be a big gun. It may be too big for you to reach the trigger. I have a medium to large in between, you know, more towards the large size. And you can see my, my fingers get a good purchase on it. And the way I measure my gun grips is when um, 
I look at the corner of my nail where it approaches this, and that's how I measure the guns. And you know, if it's like this, it's too big, and so forth. Let's just take a look at the uh, Beretta before I talk about it more. You have the serial number on the frame. And this one you, you can see was made in the USA. It was made in uh, Echo Creek, Maryland. So whenever you find a Beretta, they're going to be made here in the U.S. or they're going to be made in Italy. Some people like the uh, Italy guns better, and I find them that they're very well made. However, these USA made guns are well made as well. Uh, so these are discontinued. I know that um, Beretta has partnered with Langdon Tactical and Wilson. So they're making contemporary compacts and maybe Centurions, but they're a lot different. I think there's rails on them and stuff. Uh, but I like these without rails, the compact uh, versions. Here you see we have a lanyard. All right, let's go top to bottom. We're going to talk about this uh, gun. Uh, if you want to learn a lot more about uh, Berettas, I have full length 30, 40 minute videos. Um, if you check my videos on Berettas, I have a lot of Berettas. So we're just going to talk about this particular Centurion. So this one came, oh, so this was police issue. Um, so if you find a Beretta where right here there's a shield with the letter P in it, then that means it was a police issue. And during the ban, they'll, they'll have the higher cap magazines and they often have night sights. Um, sometime later on in the production, they change the location of the police markings to right here. You're going to see that there is, a, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a shield with a P in it. So it's a, it's a lot smaller than it used to be on the other side when it was on the slide. But here we have, there you can see the P in the shield. So that means it was uh, meant for the police right there. So this police issue, and that's why I got lucky because there's hardly any wear on it and hardly any shooting on it. And it's a double single because those, the uh, civilian uh, versions of this are very difficult to find. I don't think they made a lot of them, of the uh, civilian uh, 40 versions. All right, so here's the uh, night sights. They are uh, dead night sights that came with the gun, obviously, because they're 20 years old. And so a little bit harder to see in day shooting. There's a lot of light in here, so they look bright, but there's little white rings around the sight for day, and then you got the night for night, which does, doesn't work. So I'm going to be putting, I just ordered some uh, glow paint, almost like what H&K has on their guns, and I'm gonna put those on my guns that have dead night sights. My 3913 Smith & Wesson has the same thing. And so I'm gonna put white paint and then put the fluorescent over it, and this one is fluorescent daytime and then glow in the dark for at night. Uh, so they're uh, luminous for nighttime. So I can't wait to put those on. But right now, this is what uh, often comes on the Centurions or other police issue Berettas. So those are nice. They're all steel. They're not polymer or anything. Open slide design. It has a carbon steel and it's sort of like a, a paint or a coating. It's not quite bluing. Well, it's not bluing at all. It's sort of a coating. And that's why it wears okay, but it has, uh, you can see where the wear comes off. Very similar to bluing, but it is a coating. Here's the double action, single action uh, operation. So after the first shot, you're gonna have the hammer cock back, and then you put it on safe by dropping the ambidextrous safety. I wish it was a G model. The G model, what happens is when you decock the hammer, it's gonna act a lot like the double action, single action SIG, where you drop the hammer and then it pops back up automatically. Uh, so that's a G model. But well, this one is the FS model. And by the way, uh, 92 FS, those are the two, uh, those are the safety features that they added, uh, all the improvements on the F and then the S for the safety feature where they put a, um, an extension to the pin for the hammer that goes up into the slide. So if there's a, fly, a slide breaking or cracking failure, the slide won't come off and hit the operator. That, that will capture it. So even though this is called the 96, you might wonder why they never came out with the 96 FS. That's because when the 96 came out, when they first started putting 40 caliber, um, making 40 caliber Berettas, um, all the improvements to the 92 series were already done. So there was no modifications. It, it, it came out already as the, um, as the FS already built in. So that's why it's just a 96, or unless it's a compact or Centurion or something like that. All right, so here we have the 
slide release. So right now you can do the slide lock. Also acts as a slide release. I don't like dropping an empty chamber. There we go. So that's the uh, slide release. And here is the safety again. Here's the takedown lever. We're going to take it down so I can show you the insides in a minute. Here we have the serial number. It has uh, grooves for those people that still shoot like this and put their uh, offhand finger on the trigger guard or from the trigger guard. So you have that little um, ledge there for that. They're still doing that on a lot of these. This one has a steel guide rod. So let's talk about that now. This one was made when they were making all uh, steel and other metal components. And so this one doesn't have any plastic parts yet, except for one, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but at some point, in order to uh, make it less expensive to make, maybe also for lighter weight, a lot of the components became polymer that were formerly uh, all steel. And the Berettas, uh, it, they're still fully functional. They work fine. And all the modern Berettas, I believe, uh, have the plast so-called plastic parts. So the parts are the trigger, mag release, safety, and the lanyard, which is also the mainspring cap or mainspring housing that holds the bottom of the mainspring along with the strut. And that's plastic or polymer. Same thing, but it's a better plastic, obviously. And, and the guide rod. So those are the parts that you would find that would be uh, either all plastic or mainly like sheet metal with plastic over it or some kind of uh, uh, smaller amount of steel in the component. But this one doesn't have that. This one was made when they're still doing all steel components. So the trigger is steel and so is the safety and the guide rod, which I really like to be steel, not polymer on guns. And the only thing is uh, this plastic, obviously you have the polymer grips and the lanyard cap. This one is uh, polymer as well. Uh, but I might replace that. This way everything will be steel. But it seems, uh, I've never heard of failures on it. I think once I heard of one where the the lanyard snapped off, but the cap was fine. It was still fully functional. There are serrations on the front of the grip. Makes it very controllable. And it's not as aggressive as checkering, so it's not going to abrade your hand at all. And the same with the back. You've got nice serrations there. All right, let's take it down. We'll look inside. We'll show you and we'll talk a little bit about that. Here we have an ample sized uh, magwell. A little bit flared in the front, easy to insert the magazine. And the magazine is tapered at the front, so very easy uh, to uh, put in. Better if I don't look through the camera. So very easy to put in, snaps into place very well, and flies right out, um, whether there's rounds in it or not. The double action pull is uh, very smooth and easy. And the, and the single action is nice as well. Barely any creep. I mean, barely any movement, and it is going to. Uh, so you got a tiny little bit of take up. Then you got the reset. And then if you like riding the reset instead of slapping the trigger, we'll show you the reset. It's right there. So it's not super short, but it's not terribly long either. So very nice trigger. All right, let's take the slide off. Um, normally they recommend locking the slide back, you know, take out the magazine, um, which is a really great way to do it. However, if the magazine was out already, let's say, um, you don't have to retract the slide. It's always going to do for safety. But if you know it's empty, you just cleared it. All you do is push the button here. Just push that button and swing this down and the slide comes off. A lot of people don't realize you don't have to pull the slide back, but it's always recommended because you do want to make sure that the gun is empty. And here we have the frame. The frame is very light because it's made out of aluminum, aluminum alloy. Uh, don't be confused by manufacturers that list their uh, gun frames as alloy. It, it tells you nothing. <laughs> Anybody who, who tells you that they have an alloy frame gun is telling you nothing um, because all the frames that are made out of steel are steel alloys, all the slides our carbon or stainless steel alloys. And alloy means it is a mixture of metals. Almost every gun part, the trigger and the hammer and all these gun parts are gonna be different alloys of steel. The slide is the same thing. The frames are the same thing. They're gonna be aluminum alloy or steel alloy. So when they say, oh, it's an alloy frame, 
They identify that with aluminum, but it's a really bad thing to do because every aluminum uh, part made for almost any device or firearm is going to be an alloy of aluminum. It's not, aluminum is too soft. It's going to have other metals in it. And so it's one of my pet peeves when people say they have alloy. Um, so don't be confused by that. It's an aluminum alloy. It's aluminum with lots of other metals in different proportions, often proprietary. They don't want to know, even know the formula because uh, they spend a lot of research time to find the exact right formula that works for their guns. That's going to be durable and strong and all those issues and lightweight. Uh, another very interesting one is scandium. Uh, scandium frames are, is a misnomer uh, as well as calling something alloy. Scandium frames are actually aluminum alloy. They're like 98% aluminum and then other alloys. The reason why it's called a scandium frame, because scandium is so expensive and so rare, I think it only comes from uh, the Soviet Union, um, that it's, it's like ten or $15,000 an ounce. You know, gold's like, what, $1,500 an ounce right now, thereabouts? It's like seven, eight times as expensive as gold. It's crazy. It is so hard to get, I guess, and so rare that it's very, very expensive. If somebody was going to make a frame out of scandium, all scandium, or a scandium alloy that was mostly scandium, that frame would cost like $100,000. And so uh, it's, uh, it's just a very, it's like 0.1% scandium or less. Um, but it adds so much strength that it's nothing like aluminum at that point. It really makes um, the frame a lot stronger, but it is very expensive to use and make. That's why you don't see it often. You see it in lightweight revolvers. And it's really funny when I hear people on reviews say that they don't like scanning frames because they're too light. They'd rather have aluminum. It makes no sense because there's no way you can measure the difference um, with 0.1 or less percent scanning in a frame. So anyway, another one of my pet peeves. So this is a uh, aluminum, aluminum alloy and it's very light and it's, it's fairly strong. They've been doing it for quite a while. Gun manufacturers of aluminum now. If you take a look at the rails, if you're going to buy one, just look at the rails and you're going to see how much use the gun had by how much silver you're going to see on the rails. And on this one here, it's uh, very minimal. Right here, you can see a little bit of the, see that? Sometimes you'll see that all the way across and all over the rails. That means it has a lot, many thousands of rounds for the gun. This one, I would say, just has hundreds, not thousands. So that's how you would check that on um, the rail. And here's a little bit of the feed ramp. You never want to polish that because this is anodized to keep the surface hard. If you polish that and grind it down, you're going to be going to the, the softer interior of, of the uh, aluminum alloy. So you don't want to do that. All right, so there's the frame. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of room in this trigger guard for a gloved hand. So that's one of the benefits is of the, um, the 92, 96 series as well. <clears throat> so here we have the inside of the slide. Uh, the slide is shorter, as is the barrel on these Centurions. I should have mentioned that sooner. This is a 4.3 inch barrel. Technically, I guess it's 4.29, but close enough to 4.3 compared to 4.9 of the full size pistol. So it's about 0.6 inches shorter. That's why it doesn't stick out too much from the slide, but the slide is shorter and lighter as well. What's really strange is the 96 slide weighs the same as the 92 and the spring is the same weight. It doesn't make too much sense to me because the 40 pressure curve, weight of the bullets and everything is so much more powerful. It seems like they really should be having uh, heavier springs and so forth for that. Uh, but that's why the Brigadier came out. And the Brigadier is the same as the Centurion, except that it has uh, a thicker uh, and more metal right here where the locking blocks are to make the, um, uh, the slide heavier for less battering of the frame and also to beef up the locking block area, which is sometimes a problem. That's where the slide is thinner right there. As you can see, we have a full uh, metal guide rod, which is really nice. So all you do is, what I do is aim it away from me. Make sure you don't aim the, gun, the slide towards anything you don't want to ruin because um, a lot of recoil springs that aren't captive like this one have shot out at high velocity. And, and I, I believe me, I've, I've done it before where I've broken, <laughs> where I broke a few things through the many years of using these guns. Um, yeah, so you want to be careful. But this one doesn't fly up too much. So one you got to watch out for is the Smith & Wesson third gen guns. Man, those springs are like this long and you could probably launch it 30 or 40 feet. So this one is really not an issue. I forgot, that just drops out. That's not a, too much of a problem. 
that you really pull it back and let go. So here we go. Here we have the recoil spring and recoil spring guide. That is a solid piece of steel right there. Then here we have the barrel. Very easy to remove. You just push on that thing and it drops out this way. And then to put back in, you do the same thing. Sometimes people have a problem and won't drop in. You just kind of tap it like this. You know, keep tapping it around. And then it, it falls back into place. And then you take the recoil spring and put it into the front of the recoil spring retainer there. Push it back and catch it on the ledge. And that, that's all there is to it. Inside here, you can see the, uh, the decocking mechanism there as it moves inside. And then right here, that little part, that metal piece there, that is the firing pin safety. So if it drops, it's not going to hit and go off at all. That gets raised up and frees up the uh, firing pin to hit the primer when the trigger is pulled all the way to the back. And to simulate that, I could push on it and you'll see a rise out. So whenever you see bread is opera, you'll see this thing. So when that goes all the way up, the firing pin is free to hit the primer. And that happens when you pull the trigger. We'll, we'll see that in a second. All right, so putting it back is easy. You just put it along the, um, the guide rails there. Then you want to lock it to the rear. Oh, it pops up automatically. There you go. And there we have it back together. Let's do some snap caps. I'll show you how it operates. So that loads up the round. You decock it until you're ready. You can leave it on safe. It's not going to do anything. You push the decocker up, pull the trigger, double action. It's going to eject the round, load the next one, and you're good to go again. Very positive ejection. And with the open slide design, these guns are extremely reliable, especially 9mm, what they were designed for more so than the 40, but the 40 is no slouch either, and they work very well, and that's why police use them all over the country. Sometimes you'll find these centurions with police markings, which is really nice. Over here, you'll have a lot of times a shield with a P, and then on this side, often on the slide over here, and other places on the gun, you will find like SF, I mean, uh, FPD for, um, you know, Fayetteville Police Department or something, or San Francisco. If you see SF, PD, there's a good chance it was, uh, it was carried in San Francisco. So that's really exciting to see as well. Let me look at my notes, see if I forgot anything. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look at the writing on this side. On this side of the slide, we have Model 96 Centurion, caliber 40, patented. And what's nice on this one, it's not plastered all over the place. This was early enough in the production that it does say read manual for safe operation uh, right here, but it's hard to see. It's not written in letters and all over the slide you see sometimes. On the bread, it, it became worse. So I like that, that it's kind of subdued. We have a reversible mag release. You could actually take the safety, I mean the uh, mag release here, and you can move it over to the other side. The safety, we're all set. We've got the red dot, which shows that it's safe, and then red for ready to fire. Let's see if there's anything else I forgot here. Oh, 32 ounces. I'm not going to go over all the specs, you know, with the length and everything. You can easily look that up. But this is only 32 ounces, um, but still for a carry gun, it's a lot of weight. Uh, 32 ounces, 2 pounds, compared to like a Glock 23 or something, which is going to be about 24 ounces, 25 ounces in that range. It's going to be uh, heavier than that by about, I don't know, 6, 7 ounces, something like that. Depends on the gun. So 32, not too bad. Uh, Full-size one's around 34 and fully loaded, you're looking around uh, with the holster and everything right around 40 ounces. So you've got uh, about two and a half pounds. So it is a substantial weight, but it is less than the full size one. And for a police duty or military gun, uh, concealed carry, you can do it. It's just going to be heavier than other options. Uh, but that being said, in the 70s, I carried uh, uh, on the job a uh, combat commander, which is the all steel commander. That's what they called it back then. Now they call it the commander. And they call the lightweight commander the lightweight commander instead of just commander. But I carried a combat commander years ago, and that's even uh, heavier, fully loaded, um, or very similar. And I had no problem doing that.
So, all right, so the pros and cons of the Centurion series of pistols are going to be uh, on the 40. It's going to be low recoil. These guns uh, handle recoil very well with the very large uh, back here for full uh, service area on, the, on that web part right there. It absorbs recoil really well, as does the hump here. It's very ergonomic in the hand. And when you do the proper two hand hold, where this area here has the palm of your left hand, like this. You're going to absorb recall very well in that 40, so uh, it handles the 40 caliber uh, very well, and it doesn't flip up as high as other guns uh, might, even though the um, the sights are very high for this gun. It has a um, a little bit high sight radius compared to um, a Glock, which would be much lower in the hand, so it is a little bit high. Um, Nice double action, single action triggers, very nice. And those could be um, made even lighter if wanted to, if you send it out. And it has, it's gonna be um, uh, handling the recoil very well because of the slide operation as well. And very reliable because the almost straight shot into the barrel, as well as the open slide design, you, you, it's almost impossible to get a stove pipe. It can't happen, but it's almost possible to do so. Uh, the cons is gonna be, uh, these are difficult to find in good condition. Um, but even if it has some wear on it, it might not have been shot a lot. So just check those rails on the inside for that. Um, shorter lifespan on these guns compared to the 9 because of the high pressure curve and the higher recoil and the, the higher slide velocity. But that can be said for all the other 40s including the uh, Browning High Power and the Glock. And they all have reduced lifespans compared to the 9. So that's not just for this gun. And of course it's heavy for carry. And so... Uh, that's the story there. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here on the Breda Centurion. I'm so glad I found this one. When I, Good thing I walked into the store when I did. And I'm really happy. I just came back from the range yesterday. Functioned very well, uh, just like what I expected. I can't wait to get the new uh, painted sights on there. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. I hope you liked this video of the Centurion. Check out my other Breda videos if you want to see more on that. And... Please um, hit the little bell notification. It'll let you know when new videos are coming. I'm making more all the time. I'm making one tomorrow on a rare SKS. Take care and have a great day. We hope to catch you here again soon. Take care.